when they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O oh Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying in a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Let us pray. God, we, your people, are in need of a word from you. And so into the chaos and turmoil of this present moment, we pray that you would speak. By the power of your Spirit, open your word to us this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are certain moments in the gospel narrative, in the story of Jesus' life, that stand out. Naturally, the crucifixion and resurrection are uh, those that stand out perhaps the most. But there are others that are very close in, in importance, and one of those, I think, is Palm Sunday the triumphal entry, the moment when Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time, which begins the ball rolling toward his crucifixion. Like the crucifixion, like the resurrection, like other significant moments, Palm Sunday reveals so much to us about Jesus, about his purpose, about why he was doing what he was doing, and about how he was doing the work of God. There's so much embedded in this story. 
It's important to remember what Jerusalem meant to the Jewish people, what it meant to Jesus and others. It was the center of religious authority. It was the center of religious practice. It was the heart of the Jewish community. Also, at that time, it was the center of political authority. There wasn't a lot of political authority in Jerusalem, but what was there uh, was uh, centered in Jerusalem. It was the sort of an outpost of the Roman Empire. And so Jesus is entering these two centers all at once. And Jerusalem, over the course of his whole ministry, has just loomed over him like a cloud. At one point in Luke's gospel, Jesus sets his face to Jerusalem, a very ominous sense of Jesus moving toward this ultimate climax or conclusion of his ministry. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. Jesus seems to sense that Jerusalem is where his journey will end. And so his entry into this city is full of foreboding, but it's also full of symbolism. So I have been, for the, the, the season of Lent, I've been looking at the last words of Jesus, the words that Jesus speaks from the cross. And today, we're going to tackle the final words that Jesus spoke from the cross. But I also want to unpack the triumphal entry because this day is so important. And I think, I think we can bring these two into conversation with one another. The triumphal entry and the cross. Now, when Jesus was speaking his dying words from the cross, he was not giving thought to preachers who needed a six-week series for the season of Lent. Nobody's perfect, right? So I'm taking the last two sayings of Jesus from the cross, and I'm squeezing them together into this one week. So John says, or Jesus says in John's gospel, it is finished. And in Luke's gospel, Jesus prays, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now these two statements, if we think about them carefully, they feel like two sides of the same coin. They both seem to express a similar spirit, of uh, a sense of completion, of fulfillment, but there's not a sense of resignation or defeat. There is a willing acceptance of the finality of this moment and the fulfillment of Jesus' work. Jesus has accomplished what he set out to do. Which is what? What exactly did Jesus set out to do? What exactly was Jesus' purpose? And what is he accomplishing for us or for anyone by dying on the cross? The answer to this question is what theologians call the atonement or the doctrine of the atonement. It's a made-up word. Theologians are great at making up words. It's a combination of at one and then meant. At one meant. Atonement. It's how we are made one with God. How the, the rift or the distance or alienation between us and God is corrected. And we believe that in some way that that atonement, that reconciliation happens in Jesus Christ on the cross. But we don't know exactly how. We've argued about it for centuries. The dominant story of how this happens is that God is a just God. And God's justice is offended by our sin. And God cannot just ignore our sin because God is just. There has to be a payment. There has to be satisfaction for that sin. So instead of all of us suffering the justice of God that we deserve, Jesus pays the price for us. This should sound very familiar. This is how most Christians over, the, over most of the course of Christian history have tended to articulate the doctrine of the atonement. This is how we have tended to understand how Jesus dying on a cross does anything for anyone. Except that this doctrine doesn't go back all the way to Jesus. It doesn't go back all the way to Scripture. In fact, it only goes back to the 11th century to a church leader named Anselm. And he presented this as one way of understanding the work of God in Christ 
on the cross. But it is just one interpretation, and it's not a perfect one. There is no perfect interpretation, no perfect uh, theology of the atonement. The uh, pastor and author Adam Hamilton says this, Jesus' death is more like a sermon than a transaction. And I think that captures it really well. It captures what our attitude toward this doctrine ought to be. We want to be careful not to prejudge the meaning of this sermon that Jesus is preaching. We don't want to uh, prejudge the meaning of his death on the cross based on one single metaphor, that of a of satisfaction or of, a, of payment of a debt. The good of Anselm's story, the good of this particular way of looking at the atonement is that it magnifies the significance of the cross. It makes sure we have a laser focus on how important that moment is, not just in the life of Jesus, but in the life of faith and in the history of the church, that this moment has changed everything forever. But its weakness is that because it magnifies the cross to such a great extent, it minimizes what comes before the cross. It minimizes the life of Jesus, his teaching, his healing, the things that he does in his ministry. These become a means to an end. These become a way to get him on the cross so that that debt can be paid. Palm Sunday is just how Jesus gets into Jerusalem. It doesn't have the deep, significant meaning that I believe, that so many believe is there in Scripture. No interpretation of the cross is perfect. But I think we can bring the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, into conversation with the cross, and I think that it will help us see what is really happening there, the depth uh, of what is going on in the crucifixion. So let's start with that entry. Jesus entering Jerusalem. Jesus entering the center of both religious and political authority. By entering the city the way that he does, he makes a powerful symbolic statement to both of these centers of power, both to the religious authorities and to the political authorities there in Jerusalem. So first his religious statement, his statement to the religious authorities. And Matthew draws the connection uh, in a way that is just crystal clear for us by quoting the prophet Zechariah. And I'm reading now from Zechariah. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. The prophet Zechariah was speaking to the people of Israel as they were returning from exile. They were returning to a Jerusalem that needed to be rebuilt. They were returning to a Jewish people who needed to be rebuilt. And so the, uh, the attitude here is, is a hopeful one of a king coming who will restore Jerusalem. But more than that, now Zechariah talks about him coming uh, in a humble way, riding on a donkey. But Zechariah also goes on to say that this king will devastate Israel's enemies, will rule from sea to sea. It's the greatness of Israel resurgent. That is the vision of this prophet. And that's actually not far from the expectation that many people had of Jesus. Now, we've heard over the last several years uh, quite a lot in political news about dog whistles. You've probably heard that phrase before. It's it's when a politician and politicians on both sides uh, do this quite a lot. They say things that um, maybe to the casual observer don't seem uh, particularly interesting but to their uh, energized and uh, highly focused political base, it means a lot. And it gets them engaged and it makes them, maybe it it energizes them further, makes them want to be involved. The idea is a dog whistle is something that some can hear and others can't, right? It's signaling to some so that others can't hear it. You might think, if you you could read the story of Palm Sunday in, in a way that's similar to this idea of dog whistling, that this is what Jesus is doing, that Jesus is coming in, sending a signal to the religious base of the Jewish people, the people who would recognize this particular symbol from Scripture. He's sending that signal, except he's not doing it to energize them. He's doing it to prove a point. And the point he's proving is how far off their expectations really are. 
Because here comes Jesus, flesh and blood, fulfilling the, the, the prophecy of Zechariah, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. He's coming and he's humble. Let's forget the victorious business for now. And so the people get excited and they shout Hosanna and they lay down their cloaks because they see their king coming. Their king coming to bring Israel back to what it once was, to restore their power as a nation, to get Rome out of Palestine, to do all of these great things that they have been waiting for God to do for them. And Jesus knows that when he comes into Jerusalem, the way that he is, he knows that he is sparking all of this energy and excitement. And he knows the sharp contrast that he is going to draw between those expectations and the reality as it's going to unfold in the week to come. So he is setting them up with this signal that he's giving them so that they will begin to realize, so that it will begin to sink in how far off their expectations really are. It's almost a kind of performance art that Jesus is engaging, on, engaging in. By the end of the week, the only people who are calling him king are the ones who are mercilessly mocking him, calling him king of the Jews as they jeer and put a crown of thorns on his head. Now, the political statement that Jesus is making is less nuanced. It's much clearer, much more obvious. Not just everybody walks into Jerusalem or, or enters Jerusalem the way that Jesus does. Not just everyone has people lining the walkway and shouting praises. Not just everyone enters on horseback or on a donkey, whatever the case may be. So Jesus is clearly signaling something by doing this. And to, to, to the Roman authorities, to those who aren't looking through the mindset of the Jewish people and the prophetic expectation, to the Roman authorities, what they see is someone imitating a, a conqueror, a returning, uh, someone returning victorious from battle, someone who is strong and powerful uh, among the nations, someone who could pose a political threat to them. So he's signaling all of this, and yet he's on a humble animal. He is saying to Rome that your power is at an end, except he's doing it in a way that makes very clear that he has a different understanding of power. So in short, now that I've said all that, Jesus is coming with a purpose. Jesus is entering Jerusalem with a purpose. This purpose is not pleasing to religious authorities and it's not pleasing to political authorities. His purpose, and this will lead us to the cross, his purpose is to expose the emptiness of human power, to undercut the nationalist aspirations of his fellow Jews, to demonstrate that God's kingdom is coming with humility, with sacrificial love, with unconditional compassion, with gracious suffering. And so we come now to the cross, to the last, last words of Jesus. Jesus says in John's gospel, it is finished. What is finished? What is Jesus saying he has finished? He's finished his work. He has finished his, his commission, his calling, his vocation, the thing that he felt God was calling him to do and to fulfill. He's done it. It is finished. His purpose is is complete. All of those things that I just listed, all of those reasons for entering Jerusalem are the same reasons that he is hanging on a cross in order to demonstrate the nature of God's kingdom, in order to show that power is exercised not through coercion and violence, but instead through love and self-giving and generosity and compassion and grace. His purpose is to show all of these things. These were the, the reasons for his ministry. This was the reason for his teaching and his healing and his miracles. All of his work up to this point was all focused on that single purpose. The cross doesn't overshadow that purpose. It doesn't eliminate or erase that purpose. It amplifies it. This is who Jesus is. This is why Jesus came. This purpose carries Jesus all the way from Galilee to the cross. These words that Jesus speaks, 
It is finished. These are for us a lesson about life. Now think about where Jesus' friends are, where most of them are, right? They're gone. They've, they've fled. They're nowhere around. Surely when Jesus was arrested, they thought to themselves, it is finished. Of course, they meant something different. They meant that they were finished, right? They meant that this looks like utter defeat. This is a failure. Um, all of that triumphal entry stuff, we're just going to have to forget about that. There's no victory here. We're afraid, and our leader is going to be executed. Now, they, of course, didn't have the luxury of hindsight like we do to see the significance of the cross and how that connects to all that Jesus had done for them. It looked like a failed attempt, another failed attempt, because there had been others at a Messiah, a failed attempt at expelling Roman power, a failed attempt at restoring the people of Israel. They thought it was finished. But if we see fulfillment instead of defeat in the cross, in those words that Jesus says, if we see fulfillment of the work of God and not a setback, then we see that all of life changes. We look at life differently. It means for us choosing to live according to the kingdom of God instead of according to the, the powers of Rome, the powers of this world, the way that things always and are supposed to work looking at the cross as fulfillment instead of defeat means choosing to live according to the kingdom of God. According to the example of Jesus, it means an entirely different perspective on life. It means serving a God whose work is completed and fulfilled and finished, not in powerfully overthrowing an empire, but in a humiliating death on a cross. It means a reversal of all the ways that we believe life is supposed to work looking at life in a new way. And now his other words, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. This is his third prayer from the cross. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He prays, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And here he prays, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It's his second time quoting a psalm. In Mark's gospel, he quotes the psalm, uh, the 22nd psalm, and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here, these words come straight from Psalm 31. These two psalms are both psalms of, of uh, fear and worry and concern, psalms that express uh, that, that the psalmist is being surrounded and set upon by his enemies. Both psalms have a similar theme, a similar tenor, yet Mark quotes the most uh, uh, despairing verse of the 22nd Psalm and in Luke's Gospel Jesus quotes the most trusting verse of that Psalm. Even in the midst of challenge, even in the midst of despair, Jesus is giving an expression of trust. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And this for us is a lesson about death. The words it is finished is a lesson about life. These words are for us a lesson about death. The Heidelberg Catechism is a series of questions and answers. And the first question, which I've quoted many times, is what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer in part is that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, that I belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, what's really interesting about these words, about this prayer of Jesus, is that it becomes, if it wasn't already at the time that Jesus was alive, we're not sure, but it becomes a practice of daily prayer among Jews. This specific verse from the Psalms, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A prayer that was said daily at the end of the day. A prayer that is an expression of trust, daily trust. Acknowledging that we belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to God. There is a prayer that I say 
at virtually every funeral that I do that ties these two sayings together, that ties together the lesson about life and the lesson about death. And part of the prayer goes like this. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are ended, enable us to die as those who go forth to live so that living or dying our life may be in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We live as those who are prepared to die. We live as those who understand that God works not through power and triumph and victory and glory, but God works through weakness and humility and, yes, even challenge and suffering. We understand that Jesus' own purpose was fulfilled through his suffering, that that wasn't an accident or a defeat. We know that God works through sacrificial love and not through the will to power. We live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are ended, enable us to die as those who go forth to live. We die as those who go forth to live. We seek to make Jesus' expression of trust in his dying moment our own. We understand that we belong to God, even in death. Make that a daily prayer. Make that a daily expression of trust. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So now we come to it. We come to the end. Jesus has spoken his last words. The temple curtain, that which separates us from the presence of God, has been torn in two. And Jesus breathes his last. Jesus may say that it is finished. But we know that God is not finished yet. Amen.